Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by art making what you make. Today on The Creators, Lowell, Massachusetts songwriter and musician Eddie Dyer, who has just released a new album called Far Be It From Me. Eddie also fronts a Celtic gypsy punk band called The Dremlins. So we invite you to subscribe if you haven't already. Give us that thumbs up, just because, and comment what you find here, what you'd like to find here. And now on with the show. Welcome back, everybody. And we are here uh, for another edition of The Creators here at Sum City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. I'm Tom Jackson, and once again, I have commandeered the most comfortable chair in the <laughs> studio. Uh, and with us today uh, is uh, uh, an old friend and uh, an excellent musician and songwriter uh, who I've known for a number of years now, Eddie Dyer. Welcome to The Creators. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. Really uh, glad to be here. Eddie uh, <laughs> is... Uh, uh, in addition to uh, being uh, an excellent songwriter, you'll you'll hear in his lyrics uh, that there's really a uh, uh, quite often a, a, a political message, um, and uh, one that I've always appreciated. Uh, but we'll uh, you know we'll hear more about that uh, as we go through the interview. Um, first of all, you know, our our standard question here on the creators, uh, we we talk with. Uh, all kinds of creators. So, are you a creator? And uh, you know, what what type would you say you are? And um, you know, what is the creative process? What, what does that mean to you? I, I guess I think of myself as a songsmith and recording artist. Um, I would have to say my main instrument is the recording studio and uh, the song crafting. Um, so that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We, you know, we're we're sitting here uh, recording an interview show with an artist uh, again uh, that's going to go out on YouTube and uh, you know hopefully some other uh, platforms and things like that as well. Um, now that we're in the digital age, you know, uh, I know you've been you've been writing songs since probably at least the very early part of that age, mm -hmm. if not even before that. True that. Um, talk to us about how you, uh, how has that affected you, you know, in terms of your ability to get your work uh, in front of people and, you know, I mean, kind of go through the promotional process that one has to go through if you want to get out there and play live, which I know you do. There are a lot of layers to it. I would have to say, as far as exposure, the digital platform, you know, uh, at first glance offers infinite opportunities. Uh, I, um, since the digital revolution, I've always uh, had really good luck at connecting with people that I normally would not have had access to. You know, people who played on records I grew up listening to. I got um, Earl Slick, who uh, is on John Lennon's last two albums, and he's uh, played with Bowie. Uh, I mean, um, I just s sent him a MySpace <laughs> email one year, and two months later he came and played on my record. <laughs> you know, so, wow. so in, in that way it's been great. Unfortunately, the digital age, as much as it, by all appearances, has seemed to level the playing field, it also unfortunately coincides with late stage capitalism, <laughs> where most of yeah. us, uh, in whatever type of work we do, most of us, are having our work devalued and co-opted by moneyed interests. And uh, so I think of it as an unfortunate coincidence, if anything. Yeah, I really, since the, uh, the dawning of Napster, right. uh, however many years ago that was, it, you know, uh, I mean, if, I, I always say I have a nephew who has bragged to me for years that he doesn't pay anything for the music that he listens oh, to. Oh, sure, you know? right. And yeah. I mean, he's far from uh, an anomaly. Uh, there's so many people who uh, that's how they get their music now and it doesn't cost anything. Absolutely. And, and there's that other issue of, you know, if you really want to support a particular artist, uh, particularly one who's not 
already a multimillionaire because they're you know uh, uh, some sort of a rock star or, or you know an actress or something like sure. that as well. Yeah, I know. Um, right. You know, and, and that doesn't seem to be really a, a sort of counter argument that has has done a whole lot, except maybe the development of a few different platforms where you know musicians can try to monetize uh, their work at least a little bit. Have you found much success with some of the alternative platforms that are out there? I have. I have definitely uh, had that opportunity to put myself on the map. Uh, the, the, um, you know, the other side of that is that there's not much of a map anymore. It's really just you're kind of shooting out into space, you know, mm -hmm. into the void, you know. So, you know, it's also, I mean, everybody has a platform. You know what I mean? So, and, you know, and maybe that's, ultimately, that's for the best. Maybe art should be democratized in that way, uh, in that, you know, um, if, you know, if it's helping institutions crumble that no longer serve us, then I'm all for that. You know, but um, but you know the way the way things are now, uh, YouTube, for example, being you know um, a lot you know plenty of people get their music from YouTube, and mm -hmm. you're directly uh, you're not only not supporting that artist, but you're also putting money in the pockets of those who, you know, shut all of these independent artists out because they've monopolized all, the, all these media. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's far from black and white, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, before this, it was home taping. I remember having a Dead Kennedys album, um, and God We Trust Incorporated, and on the other side, it was intentionally left blank, and it said, home taping is killing record industry profits. Mm -hmm. We left this side blank so you can help, mm -hmm. which, you know, so, I mean, uh, it's, it's multifaceted. It's just a question, for me, diversifying, you know, and, and, I, and I hate to use that word because it makes me sound like somebody from freaking Wall Street or something. <laughs> but, you know, it, as far as diversifying, uh, you know, I can do a lot of different things, you know, but, um, you know, as far as somebody like me, an independent artist, making a living off of their recordings alone, it's just a thing of the past. Yeah. You know, and I say that at the risk of sounding like an old man yelling at kids to get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but I, I certainly do hear it um, a lot. It's definitely more, and, and that has affected uh, a number of different things, not just music, but probably music is the most adversely affected from what I can see in terms of the arts. But even films, you know, the, the, especially independent films, um, it's had an effect on that uh, as well. Um, I can attest to that personally. Um, I want to take a, a step back now to uh, maybe talk a little bit about, you mentioned the Dead Kennedys a, a few minutes ago. Um, what were some of your early influences? So who were the uh, bands or, or individual musicians who really inspired you to pick up a guitar and start writing songs? I've wanted to write songs since I was four years old. And I went down to my brother, my older brother Joe's bedroom, and he sat me up on the top bunk and started playing the Beatles, 1967 to 1970. I I can still hear the crackle of the vinyl. I, I mean, that was that was life changing. Um, so uh, let's see. I mean, everyone from the Beatles to uh, Bowie is a big uh, influence of mine. To Nick Drake to Black Flag to Cassandra Wilson. It's just, you know, that's, that's a, a rabbit hole, uh, all the artists that have uh, informed my small work. Uh, that, that's probably a whole other TV show. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so when you're writing songs, I mean, you know, I've talked to musicians who uh, sometimes they'll they'll dream a song, and if they manage to remember it, they'll mm -hmm. they'll record that. Uh, others have this very disciplined process that they go through. Others are are completely you know undisciplined. It just happens when it happens. 
What what kind of creative process uh, works for you? What works for me is that I don't codify it. I've had songs come to me in dreams before. I've had chord patterns come to me in dreams, and uh, I've had uh, I've written lyrics based on me thinking, me having the lyrics wrong to an existing song that I want to sing. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, but for me, what has really worked, I would have to say, is not codifying it, not saying this is my process, because I try to employ a lot of different processes. Uh, the people that have always fascinated me were um, people like like E.E. E. Cummings, who uh, was trained as a cubist painter in, in, in the tradition of Picasso, and applied that to poetry. Mm. You know, just putting things that don't necessarily fit together and seeing what that third thing is, that weird little spark that happens, that's what moves me. All right, and so uh, let's uh, let's have some music now. All right, let's do uh, it. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about this first song that you're going to do. Sure, um, this uh, is um, called "There's Everything Else in the World," and then there's whiskey. I don't know if you remember the Reagan Babies, uh, but Jimmy Absolutely. Otis, Jimmy Otis, who played piano for the Reagan Babies. Um, since uh, in, in the years since has taken up the accordion and we've started this uh, duo um, kind of uh, we called the drumlins and we've started this this duo together and we call it Celtic Gypsy Punk um, we're both we do a lot of you know the Irish drinking and rebel songs uh, songs from the Irish Civil War and Jimmy's very versed in East European folk music, a lot of the minor key, almost polka type of stuff. And, um, and uh, we bring the punk rock too. Um, and of course, we were both Reagan babies, so that's where that comes Sounds from. Sounds exciting. But anyway, this next song is, uh, it's a drinking song that um, sort, of, sort of touches upon one's personal darkness as well. This is called, There's Everything Else in the World, and Then There's Whiskey. God knows what's on the floor You can't remember being this skunky before And the nightmare dancing outside the door Says come kiss me There's needles in the cabbage And there's blood in your beer There's nothing left to do But make love to the fear Cause this brandy, vodka, merlot, and tears And then there's whiskey Cold water ain't cleansing my soul And the devil just ain't letting that shit go All I'm trying to do is cash out and roll And then it hits me And I give the welcome wagon a whirl and I brush up on my 32 ounce curl Cause there's everything else in the world And then there's whiskey Cause there's everything else in the world And then there's whiskey Sip tequila till the early sunrise. And the lady with the flaming sword cuts you to size. 
And the way the fire catches her eyes makes you all misty. Instead of backwards walking through your warehouses of pain, go and join them crazy women driving you batshit insane. Cause there's Merla White and piss in the rain. And then there's whiskey! And the devil just ain't letting that shit go All I'm trying to do is cash out and roll And then it hits me I got a ton of bricks, baby And I give the welcome wagon a whirl And I brush up on my 32 ounce curl Cause there's everything else in the world And then there's whiskey Everything else in the world And then there's whiskey Cause there's everything else in the world And then there's whiskey Eddie Dyer is here with us on The Creators in uh, beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire coming to you from Sun City. Eddie Dyer Always the rabble rouser. <laughs> I'm not sure that that song gets people going. Right. Yeah, you know, I um, it's it's uh, you know, I've I've convinced a couple uh, establishments to get their liquor license specifically because of that song because you know they could have moved a bunch of shots after that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned. Um, the Reagan babies, and uh, you know, uh, I do sometimes like to, to talk with, uh, especially when we have musicians who have uh, uh, been working for uh, quite some time uh, at their craft. Uh, talk about some of the you know early bands and, and sure. things like that that they were in. Yep. Um, and of course, I remember the Reagan babies. You, that <laughs> band was active when I first got to know you. And, well, you know, uh, Tom, if they say if you can remember the Reagan babies, you weren't really there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, 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 I get that. I kind of remember the Reagan babies. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and probably a few of the other band members kind of remember a little bit, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, tell me about that uh, experience, because, it, I mean, there's there's a band you can kind of tell just by the name of the band. Uh, you had a number of songs that were uh, pretty political and uh, uh, lyrically. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it was a lot of it was topical, and um, we uh, basically, you know, we were we were talking about you know the war on terror and the po the political climate post 9/11. Not too many other people were doing that. I mean, we caught a lot of flack for that, you know. And uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm very proud of what we did. You know, uh, I remember growing up always saying I, I never uh, I, I always I never want to be one of these people who uh, completely either lives in the past uh, and rests on what they've done or completely shuns everything that they've ever done, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm very proud of uh, the way we did things and the spirit in which we did them, you know? Um, we would run every year, we ran a, uh, a death and taxes resistance festival in uh, Andover, North Andover, Massachusetts. And uh, that w really came up out of a bunch of us getting arrested and spending a month in jail um, for uh, attempting, you know, to uh, to um, do an action to uh, raise consciousness about war profiteering and disarmament. You know, and that was so a, a march from uh, uh, the IRS office uh, to <laughs> down, down Raytheon, Raytheon headquarters. Yeah, as yeah. I recall. Yeah. yeah, we often had like you know a wheelbarrow full of uh, bloody monopoly money, you know, this, this type of stuff, you know, and uh, you know I would say we really did things in the spirit of Abby Hoffman and the Yippies, and uh, you know um, I always I always believed what uh, Abby Hoffman said: if you can capture their imaginations, you can capture their hearts, and that certainly applies to music as well. But yeah. what I'll do is I'll play a song uh, that I performed quite a lot with the Reagan Babies, and uh, the um, 
middle verse of this song, I've written about each president since, uh, since George W. Bush when the song was originally written. So I'll give you the Trump verse to American Mass. These are the confessions of an American mess. Mail my list of questions out to the candidates address. Like who's on first and who's on lockdown, who's for real and who's a fake clown, who write the constitution, legalize some re-execution, the innocent attest an American mess. On American mess, an American mess. On American mess. These are the confessions of an American mess. Mail my list of grievances to the president's address. Like you're the orange man heading the uptown clan. American first means make the swamp white again. Silver spoon born in a fascist shitstorm. You're the lowest form of oompa loompa porn. All of which suggests an American mess. Not even that good old blue porn. Just the cheap stuff, you know? It's the lowest form. Mama, 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 it ain't me. Mama, this ain't my corporation, tis a day. Mama, I'm living in a full cell democracy. These are the confessions of an American mess. Mail my declarations out to all my friends' address. Tell them we can wake a man, we can shake a man, we can sow the seeds of safety. Tell them we can shake those last foundations, then we can make our reparations when we put to rest this American mess. On American mess, an American mess. On American mess, an American mess, an American mess. On American mess, an American mess, an American mess. On American mess, on American mess, on American mess. Don't sue me, Roald Dahl's estate. But, uh... <laughs> that, by the way, uh, I, I'm so glad you played that song because that, that is my absolute number one all-time favorite Reagan Baby song. Oh, thank you very sure. much. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I wrote that uh, in 2000 outside of the presidential debates up at the JFK um, in uh, Boston. It was George W. Bush and Al Gore, and they had uh, shut Nader out, and there was that massive protest. They, you know, they kind of, uh, they were turning people away who had tickets in their hands. Right, it's pretty that. ridiculous, pretty ridiculous stuff. So um, that song was was written with a very strong uh, smell of tear gas in the air. <laughs> it was right there, right, you know? Yeah, it's got that tear gassy feel to it. <laughs> it's got that tear gassy feel to it, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna put that up on my SoundCloud, like musical genre, tear gassy. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, this, uh, I have a more recent song that I wrote. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I hate to give the political title. I love to give the tear gassy title to songs, but not the political uh, label uh, to them. Um, because this was born out of um, a uh, statewide referendum against marriage, uh, uh, against marriage equality that was passed statewide um, in, uh, in one of the states a few years back. And I was just disgusted. I mean, come on, you know? So I, um, later that, that night, I was uh, listening to um, a recording of some shamanic drum beats, and uh, this song is about uh, the journey that followed. This is called Heart of Your Rage. After a fight, I let the cedar wolf lead me deep inside Into the angry flesh of a tulip partially capsized When we washed the blood from our faces at the heart of it all See the bottom as well behind the cracks in the wall. It said, Illuminate the love that resides within the heart of your rage. 
illuminate the love that is hiding in the heart of your rage because later or soon there'll be none but the moon left to blame so cast off what's been burned in the fire keep what's been forged in the flames Liberate the love that resides within the heart of your rage. Liberate the love that is hiding in the heart of your rage. Because the sinner in grace is but one face which carries your name. So cast off what's been burned in the fire, keep what's been forged in the flames. What's been burned in the fire Keep what's been forged in the flames And love And love 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 And love songs lyrically you know I've always noticed that there's there's this intensity you know whether it's a political intensity or an emotional intensity and I mean I think I've, I've kind of always gravitated towards listening to musicians who have that type of intensity and whose lyrics really mean something um, the style of the music isn't always the the thing that necessarily makes me right. want to listen to a musician. Although mm -hmm. I, I do have my preferences, sure. But um, I've always wondered, you know, some musicians who who write with that intensity. I've heard some say in interviews that, you, that yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's not really that that personal to me or something, or you know, or maybe they say it is, um, and. Some kind of recognize that that for listeners, you know, even though it's about some of it is about really hard, difficult stuff or really intense stuff, mm -hmm. there's there's almost there's kind of like that feeling of catharsis. You know, it's something that I've heard people who talk about the absolutely. blues. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that even though a lot of it's kind of you know sad or, or whatever, that there's this feeling of catharsis. As you're as you're listening to it, and after you've listened to it, absolutely. I mean, where where are you coming from? Are these really really personal stuff, things that you that you're actually feeling, and somehow translating into song lyrics? Catharsis is the word. Um, you know, basically, um, when I have emotions inside of me that are too big to handle, I extract them with with songs or with poetry. And it's been that way for a long, long, long time. And if I didn't have that, I would maybe be dead. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it, I'm the type of person where 
I'm addicted to any kind of extreme of emotion. <laughs> and it compromises my perspective and compromises my decisions unless I have a healthy outlet for it. And music is that thing for me. It's that outlet for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we uh, have the pleasure of having musician songwriter Eddie Dyer here with us today on Some City, coming to you from beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. At uh, uh, and we're uh, we've got a little bit of time left, and I want to talk to you about you know what's uh, uh, you're based in Lowell, Mass. Uh, first of all, you know I know you play out a lot, uh, a lot of gigs in that area. And we certainly hope uh, that you'll be coming up to this area as Amen. well. Amen. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. We've got to make it happen. And where can people find your, uh, your work in, in the meantime? Maybe look online somewhere. That's eddiedyer.bandcamp.com, E-D-D-Y-D-Y-E-R.bandcamp.com. That's where most of my recorded work exists. Uh, soundcloud.com slash Eddie Dyer, E-D-D-Y-D-Y-E-R. I'm also under Facebook, facebook.com slash E-D-D-Y-D-Y-E-R, Lowell, L-O-W-E-L-L, Eddie Dyer Lowell, facebook.com slash Eddie Dyer Lowell. We were talking about platforms earlier. Bandcamp and SoundCloud have, have really become huge for, mm -hmm. for musicians. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely encourage people to, you know, I, I mean, another thing about your music is the diversity, you know, there's all kinds of musical styles that you draw from, and, uh, uh, but, but at the same time, as is the case with a lot of really good musicians, there's still that identifiable sound, you know, and maybe your voice, your vocals, or, uh, you know, that kind of thing, but the, 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 even with the three songs you've done today, I mean, there's quite the stylistic uh, <laughs> uh, diversity there. The diversity there, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I, I wonder if that, you know, because that's not really something I plan, you know, as, as a creator of songs, you know, it's just, I, I don't think to myself, okay, I'm going to write a punk rock song right now, or I'm going to write, you know, a gospel-y themed you know, soul song right now. I think this song is coming to me. How do I allow it to move through me, you know? And I think the, the only reason that that might be remarkable is because in, in, our, in our age, and, and it's probably been true since we were kids, since before then, that things are so genre-driven. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember, you know, growing up, uh, you were a genre of person. You were a hippie, or you were a punk, or you were a jock, you know? And um, it just, it's not a mechanism that operates in me. You know, it's just not, so I've never seen the advantage of giving it any sort of, any sort of credence or any sort of weight, you know? Uh, I, I feel like that would be, you know, only a, a hindrance. It, it, in respects to what I do. Well, Eddie, thank you so much for uh, being here today and um, uh, wondering if you would do us the honor of uh, playing us out with uh, one more song. Sure, sure. I will uh, play you a song right now. This song is called By the Stone Elephants. And I'll tell you, there's an interesting story uh, behind this song. Um, there is a large plot in Woodlawn Cemetery, which is just outside of Chicago, that belongs to the Showman's League of America. It was bought by the, um, basically, the union of cir circus performers. Uh, and and um, anyway, there was this horrific uh, circus train accident that happened, I would say, maybe two years later. The plot was bought in 1916. This, um, accident happened in 1918 and what's remarkable about this graveyard is a lot of the graves from back then 
um, they don't have any identifying information as about who, who, what that person's birth name was, because back then when you ran off with the circus, you know, you disappeared. They, you know, they didn't have the sort of record keeping that we do now. So there are clown names on the grave. There's Smiley and Baldy and just like numbers, you, you know, uh, gender and, and numbers. I mean, really bizarre stuff. And once a year in August, they um there are circus performers from all of the world all over the world they gather for a week uh near at this place and hold a week of solemn remembrances and on that saturday they hold this massive circus performance in the graveyard so my dream is to uh go down and and play this song for them one year this song uh is about the uh, Hagenbach Wallace circus train disaster of 1918. And the title of the song is By the Stone Elephants. <laughs> Once a year in Woodlawn Cemetery, when August in bright green is dressed Clowns from the world over gather In a place that they call showman's rest Was June 22, 1918 4 a.m. the whole circus asleep The last of two trains full of faces and names Which that dark stretch of railroad still keeps Markers read Baldy and Smiley, an unknown female 43. By the stone elephants, lay down a while your souls from the sawdust ring are free. From Illinois, they were headed off to Hammond, from there, moving on toward Monroe. From nowhere a troop train came screaming Down Michigan's Central Railroad When Alonzo Case Sergeant had been sleeping Missed the warnings, red signals and flares Desperate the flagmen all called out in vain That the train had been stopped for repairs The markers read Baldy and Smiley an unknown female, 43. By the stone elephants, lay down a while your souls from the sawdust ring are free. Most were dead inside of 30 seconds in a massive crushed steel wooden wire. Some who'd survived only then burned alive when the kerosene lanterns caught fire. There's Joe Coyle convulsing and crying, his wife and two boys crushed to death. In the end, only two shows were canceled, but still today passes by hold their breath. And as the second train held their grim roll call, Black smoke still hung thick at the scene In showman's rest yearly they gather When August is dressed in bright green The markers read Baldy and Smiley An unknown female 43 By the stone elephants lay down a while your souls from the sawdust ring are free. The markers read Baldy and Smiley, an unknown female 43. By the stone elephants, lay down a while your souls. From the sawdust ring are free.
Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, some great storytelling in that uh, in the lyrics of that song, and I hope you get your wish that you get to play that <laughs> live for them. Thank you very much. I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on uh, the Creators. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. So that's it for uh, this edition of the Creators. And uh, if you uh, uh, enjoy the show, please give us some th thumbs up uh, and uh, subscribe uh, if you are so inclined. Let people know about this. Uh, we have uh, so many talented people who are, are coming on the show um, and uh, giving us uh, some of their time. Uh, to talk about their their creations and um, it's an awesome thing so uh, thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you next time on the creators